welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Skylar, and thank you, Craig, for uh, um, joining us. Um, as the kind of the title for this webinar says, you know, people do not fear change. They fear leaders stuck in the tool age. Lessons, a lot of this is lessons from Lean's forgotten pioneers for leaders today um, is what we're going to talk about. So we're going to go through a lot of information, a lot of historical information, and, and actually Craig and I talk about this from time to time and we could talk about it for hours, but a lot of good information. Basically, it's a lot of things we need to know today are actually lessons people have already gone through, pioneered, well, forged through and pioneered in a sense, because we're talking about some things that are 80, 90, 100 plus years ago, but they're still excellent lessons. So um, uh, uh, with that, um, you know, one thing before, as we start, um, Craig, um, um, you know, we talked about this the other day, but, you know, this year we actually lost a couple of our, our you know, contemporary pioneers in this area, Doc Hall, Robert Doc Hall, and uh, um, there's also uh, uh, Tom Johnson, that uh, two modern pioneers in this field. Um, and you, you, it, they've had some impact on you as well, right? A little bit. You met um, both of them though, right? And they both had an impact on you? Yeah. But um, like briefly, do you just want to kind of go over the impact you think they had in general on the community and then personally with you? Yeah. Well, certainly, certainly from Doc's standpoint, I mean, he's one of the founders of AME, Association for Man Manufacturing Excellence, um, one of the founders of that. And uh, I, I always, always like to tease him because um, he's actually the, I blame him for Lean Frontiers coming into existence because actually at uh, many years ago at uh, one of the AME conferences in Cincinnati, uh, obviously, AME was doing things and some other organizations around lean things, but more around the manufacturing-ish operations type of thing. So I asked him if he thought it was possible to do um, a uh, conference on a more specific subject under the lean umbrella, like in this case, lean accounting. And he said, uh, yeah, I uh, think you could. I think you should. Why don't you go do that? And that's what kind of, I guess, again, I was naive enough to go, okay, sure. Doc said I could go do it. I'll go do it. And that uh, launched the first summit, Lean Accounting Summit, and eventually evolved into Lean Frontiers. Plus, just Doc wrote some of the original pioneering books on the subject as this stuff was kind of coming into the States from, you know, a, a lot of Japan um, at that time and all that. And with Tom Johnson, as I actually worked on my thesis, which was actually on Lean Accounting, Doc's the one that told me, he said, you need to look into a professor out in the Northwest, you know, Tom Johnson and Doc knew him, kind of made the connection with me. And uh, Tom was um, extraordinarily helpful in the research I did on, on lean accounting from one, just from his writings, his book, Profit Beyond Measure, which actually since somebody posted this recently on LinkedIn, uh, it's, even though that book's probably what, 20, 25, maybe years old, it's still just a incredible, insightful book to this day. Very, very the there zero inventories or attaining manufacturing excellence? Um, Doc did zero inventories. Tom Johnson wrote. Um, oh, the Tom Johnson. On measure. Oh, uh, Profit actually, Beyond Measure. A couple other books called Relevance Lost and Relevance. Yeah, that one, exactly. And prior <laughs> to that, Relevance Lost and Relevance Regained that he co authored. So all those are still very pertinent in books. And plus, just a lot of uh, uh, Tom Johnson's guidance and conversations I had with him were, were very valuable to me in my research and all that. So two extraordinarily, you know, good men, impactful men and, and, you know, mentors to myself. Yeah. I mean, kind of speaking of pioneers and the rebranding that's happened over the years, uh, you know, before it was called lean, it was called jet or just in time. Yeah. And that was large box doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Although you can trace some of that back, even back to, and we'll get into some, if you look at the, um, even the early days in Toyota, I mean, pre-World War II, they had some of that kind of just in time talk floating around. Um, they weren't they weren't actually executing on it yet, but they mm -hmm. understood that uh, this may be something that is of value. So um, I know I would steal Doc's time whenever I saw him. You see this old man in conferences. I think people just didn't know the impact he had. Yeah. And um, I asked him once, I remember, you know, there's a lot of people that want to be interested or getting interested in leadership or continuous improvement positions at companies. And they're like, well, what should I study? I'm like, oh, study? God, you know, it was just, it was kind of getting started. It wasn't even in the department yet when, when I fell into it. And uh, so I hadn't really thought about it. And he gave it 
awesome answer. I mean, and just like that, anthropology. Like, yeah. Anthropology wise, like you get enough hard science and you understand the scientific method and you understand how structures influence groups and behaviors. And uh, so I thought that was worth passing on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is. And, and, and he, I mean, that's just his background. He was a professor and he taught, you know, op stuff, which kind of, kind of, I guess maybe kind of a good segue into the first question because uh, he's taught a lot of, uh, you know, um, you know, ops type classes and so forth. It's his career as the, um, in the teaching. But uh, one thing is why, you know, why do we do such a bad job of teaching lean or, or uh, you know, operation, uh, operations and all that? Yeah, we, we do. It's almost like we unleash the concrete heads on on the rest of us at the beginning, right? I don't know how you learned, but um, I learned just getting hammered over tools and waste, and this is how Toyota does it. And But there was no why, there was no understanding of the fundamentals. It was just, you know, um, here's a problem, apply a technique, because that's what Toyota did. And it was like, this tools over principles. And uh, I think that's why we do a bad job. It seems like we just want to get to it, but um, you know, we wouldn't want a bridge built by an engineer that just skipped over all this fundamental theory stuff and just uh, learned the tools. Um, There's plenty of examples of, uh, of disasters, engineering disasters that happened because we didn't understand something foundational about how to keep steady things steady and, and, and whatnot. So um, it, I, I don't think you can skip it. I think it's, you know, we probably do a bad job teaching it in colleges because it's approached as a set of tools. Yeah. And, um, you know, as, as Steve Spear talked about this a little bit, you know, that's that's the purview of technical and trade schools, right? Not universities. And so you learn any other subject. You start with foundational before you get to practical application. And and you need both. I think you know. yeah, I would say one thing, at least, I don't know if I was just early enough, probably, I actually probably was early enough on when I got uh, my degree, we actually didn't talk much about that lean stuff, not at all. It was non-existent. Right. So I guess I didn't have any of those pre-existing pre conditions when I came out. And since I went to work for a Toyota group company, that was really kind of my first introduction to some of it. So that I guess may have been some level of an advantage. What, with that, what, what do you feel that are some of the lessons, I guess, like we mentioned in, with the title, from history that we can still apply today, you know, maybe using the kind of the, maybe some of this, um, you know, operations, as a as a springboard for that yeah um i know um even even back in the day there's actually we'll, we'll get into it you know the foundations of scientific management it was called before it was called jet and twi and um and lean right but um you had you know they they really dealt into the fundamentals back then and so you had um you know, if lean was a collection of recipes or maybe still is in a lot of companies, like it's just a set of tools and techniques and chasing waste. So was chemistry in the late 1800s when one of the pioneers was, uh, if you're a chemist, Henry Le Chatelier. So there's the equilibrium theorem if you go back to high school or college chemistry. But um, after, you know, he, he made a joke, right? Um, before he got into scientific management, it was like, uh, it was, chemistry was a good career, right? Because you could invent a recipe that nobody used and retire before anybody realized it didn't work, right? And um, and so it was pretty comfortable, but but the breakthrough was really establishing, you know, um, down to the physics of what, you know, the, why what makes chemistry work and uh, equilibrium you know, theorem was part of it. Yeah. Can you go in go a little bit more? Cause yeah, he was a chemist, but he ended up be, being make a, quite an impact on industry. Maybe right. you know, detail that out a little bit. How how that how he that transition happened? I suppose on the knowledge and techniques versus just him as a, as a chemist transitioning into a lot of the industrial work. Right. Um, is actually he he talked about that at um, at Taylor's uh, Frederick Taylor's funeral. And Taylor gets kind of a bad rap in the West. Um, his writing. It's not that it didn't age well, it was problematic back then. Even the bulletins of the Taylor Society, if you go back and Frank and Lily and Gilbreth, who are all about people, yeah. right, wrote about how problematic some of this gruff engineer's writing was when the way he talked about employees. Anybody who met him turned out loved him. Um, even the leaders of the labor unions back in the day, Gompers and Green, you know, were Taylorists. Um, but his writing, well, he probably needed an editor. For the so a good industrial engineer, but didn't have good writing skills. <laughs> didn't have good writing. So it's, it's kind of one of those, uh, the, the field of scientific management is a little unique, that if you want to go back to the original source material, it's like, uh, don't. Um, read, if you want to understand Taylor, read Henry Le Chatelier. 
And so they met and became friends at an industrial engineering conference. They're talking about high-speed steel. And so you have this industrial chemist or chemist and industrial chemist and talking to Taylor about what they did. And Taylor was really excited about this scientific management. It, yeah, it Taylor wasn't... did a lot of research and actually even published some papers on, on I think, machining speeds and feeds and things like that for steel. It's, it's what made him wealthy. It's why he didn't have to take a paycheck for talking about people and collaboration, right? He's like, hey, I just, I want this to be out there. And, um, you know, we, it, it was teamwork and people, and it's kind of the opposite of what I learned about Taylor's antithetical to Toyota. Um, it's interesting, uh, Yuichi Ueno was the first director, international director of the Taylor Society in Japan, and he coined Murray, Muda, you know, uh, Mura. And, uh, you know, so they were, it wasn't antithetical to people as we kind of taught. And, and there was a lot of collaboration and learning from each other um, back in the day. What, what time period was that in Japan? Uh, that was 1925. Um, and then in the bulletin of the Taylor Society, they, they sent a congratulations to Yoichi and Yeah, which also interesting. you talk about that with Taylor, because if you read uh, Shijo Shingo's stuff, he mm -hmm. frequently references Taylor, but also the Gilbris as well. So he was yeah. studying their work. Right, and the Gilbris were Taylorists, right, which I never knew, but um, basically writing bad, seems like a good person, died young, and then, um, and then you know, what do we call it? We called it scientific management is, is really what he wanted it to be called, too. Um, it's less confusing than Taylorism or even lean, right? We say, well, it's Toyota. It's like, okay, well, why don't we focus on the ideas because companies are run by people. Toyota is pretty candid. They make mistakes, too. Um, but, you know, what are the principles kind of underlying the techniques that that make it work. Yeah, speak, um, speak about that, I guess, from the historical standpoint, mm -hmm. what are some of those lessons from history that uh, that still apply today? Yeah, um, I think um, going back 100 years to, um, we'll talk maybe about Carol Domietsky, um, Henry Le Chatelier, but um, and maybe before we get there, let's talk about others. John Seddon, he's, he's still alive. Um, rubs people the wrong way sometimes. He's really blunt, but um, but he has a great litmus test um, for, for using tools. And so whenever we're presented with a tool, ask yourself who invented this, right? What problem were they trying to solve? And then are you having the same problem? And, and you're usually not. But if you are, then at least you understand the, the, the foundational principles behind it. If you need to tweak it, then you can do that. Um, but, um, and that kind of leads us, you know, all the way back down to, you know, we, we have this jargon that came from Japan yeah. and, you know, as if this isn't hard enough, right? Now we have to learn Japanese yeah. and uh, to, to the point where, you know, um, it's really common in a boardroom and, and people probably actually understand what most of the words are referencing, right? And then, and then we get tacked. So, yeah, you know, tax and because... and... Go well, ahead. yeah, go to the other ones and we'll circle back around to, to TAC because that has an okay. interesting history as well. But go ahead with some of the other ones as well. Oh, the, just Japanese jargon or just with yeah, um, going Japanese back? Jargon. And, yeah, I mean, we can probably get some comments, you know, list your favorites, right? You know, but the Gemba and Kanban and uh, Hoshin Kanri, um, you know, hand on, <laughs> right? You know, the light. And, uh, but there's no reason to, probably no reason to use a different word except it sounds like you know what you're talking about. And, and I, don't, I don't know if it's deliberate. I think sometimes it is. And this was a problem, you know, there's fake lean that we're here today. Oh, that's fake lean. And I think that's because we focus on the tools rather than the fundamentals. And even back in 1915 with Taylor and then in, in Europe with the scientific management pioneers there, there were opportunists. Like, oh, this looks like there's this popular now. People want it. There's some money to be made. And so you'd have some people with superficial understanding that would go in um, and just talk about the tools. And, um, you know, really what they said, well, the tools are, are fine, the recipes are fine, but, you know, the difference between a short order cook and a chef is understanding the foundational principles. And that's when you can take an old shoe and a tomato and make a gourmet meal, yeah. right? And there's no recipe for that. Or certainly one thing, and one thing you mentioned was, um, um, I do want to get back to TAC, but one thing you mentioned, this was, I found fascinating in some of our discussions, was actually, you know, this was back in the, I mean, early 20th century, um, actually how much interaction there was between, you know, the European engineers and the American engineers and even sometimes the Japanese when obviously it wasn't like you hop on a flight and, you know, eight hours you're somewhere in, in Europe and hop in, on the Autobahn and go. I mean, it was sh ships and then probably rail 
to get to these places. So it wasn't easy, but these guys got together frequently and communicated a lot direct, you know, directly together as well as with um, other, other methods. Yeah. And sharing. actually um, sharing and um, there, I mean, there's some details and just some of these conference notes on sleeping in the train car because there was no hotel available in some of them. But um, I, I think you're, um, one of the big ones that I didn't even know about, and so we started digging into the European influence, was a CIOS. Uh, it's French, but it was the Committee International of uh, um, Scientific Management, a scientific organization. And uh, Frank Gilbreth was basically the last thing that he did was, you know, put this conference together, and it was the who's who of scientific management. This would be like AME, you know, back in the '90s, and just you know, everybody who was anybody in the field was invited and showed up. And this and, was in the uh, 20s? This was in 1924 in Prague was the first one. And then it actually spurned um, the United Nations took this. Hey, this is really helping humanity. You know, if we were to get more efficient in factories, it helps everybody, you know, increase their standard of living. But the first one was in Prague. And um, and actually, Frank Gilbert died right before it started. Lillian Gilbert kind of took the mantle and her, well, not the mantle, they were she was doing really good stuff um, on her own merit and um, and uh, had a memorial service for Frank to start out with. But this is when you just realized Japan was there, um, you know, Europe was there. Basically, the entire world was trying to solve the same problem. And, you know, we have it's not just two people, you know, hammering on a horseshoe, you know, and, and communication was pretty easy. We have multiple departments, maybe in different buildings. And how do we coordinate those activities? How do we, you know, divide the labor and, and put it back together in some effective uh, uh, manner? And um, and they really laid down the fundamentals of scientific management as a science um, back in the day. <clears throat> yeah, that, that might be a good segue into maybe go tell a little bit of the background about TACT. And that how that where that came from and, and you'll talk about it and then how that circles back into not necessarily tech like we think about it but it is in part but actually the synchronization right. but go ahead and kind of give the history of that because you know everybody thinks well it came from toyota maybe it's a german word and that's about it but there's more to it than that a lot more to it yeah there is more to it and actually um so tact i always thought was interesting and in that um okay it probably wasn't the, you know, we have this U.S., um, Japan, and then, you know, back to the U.S. Um, narrative of, of how lean came to us, right? And, but it probably wasn't the American consultants that went to Japan with McCarthy, right, um, that introduced this German word, um, tact, right? And so, obviously, there was some collaboration between Germany and Japan before that. Right. And we know that it came from, you know, Junkers, uh, at least was using tact in, in the 20s um, in, for German airplane manufacturing. But um, I was actually looking into the Gantt chart. And um, so which, in Henry Gantt, yeah, which has its oh, roots back into the 18th or the 19th century, not just the 20th century. Right. And, uh, you know, they, they really did a lot of work in um, as munitions factories, uh, artillery factories in the U.S., uh, General Crozier and um, hired Gantt and, um, and somebody, Wallace Clark. And, uh, and then Gantt died. We probably called the Gantt chart because Gantt died. And then his, his uh, business partner wrote a book and dedicated the Gantt chart to him. Yeah, it wasn't, right. it wasn't but, like um, it was known predominantly as the Gantt chart. It was more from the book that his friend that wrote the book referenced it and just kind of in memoriam to him gave it gave it the name gantt chart right like and said, I, I didn't even want to pass away we may not be calling it the, we probably wouldn't be calling it the gantt chart yeah you probably wouldn't it'd be called the progress charts or whatever gantt was calling it and um and there are different types in the book and i didn't want to read it because we see them everywhere and they're so badly done you know for the most part today and um, so, but they were really worried about performances versus promises. And so really what you had was this plan versus actual. And they had this PDCA record, basically or PDSA record of, hey, this is what we promised we would do. Here's how we're actually tracking. Here's all the problems. And, and you go back, if you want to go back and read the Gantt chart, it's publicly available um, and it's well-written and probably worth it. it. It'll make you bad at meetings, right? You'll be frustrated when you see uh, one that's poorly done because you'll kind of understand what problem they were trying to solve. And if you're having the same problem where you're having trouble visualizing the factory, um, then it, it can be useful. But um, on Gantt's own Wikipedia page, the final article is about this Polish engineer, Karol Domieszki, who's probably independently invented it. 
and uh, my wife Olga speaks Polish, and so I'm like, hey, you know, honey, she probably wouldn't have uh, translated it if she'd known what it would lead into. We translated these 400 pages of works on this Karol Damietsky, but um, but he he had a similar problem, right? In 1895, and it's a Polish factory. They had foreign consultants in there that treated them like garbage. It might sound familiar to some people on you know listening in, but. Um, and but they were you know kind of a, a country occupied and they're treated really badly and uh, you know basically there was you know Polish workers or uh, Polish factories are inefficient because the workers are stupid and lazy is essentially what it was. He's like you know what they don't seem lazy they don't seem stupid. Our German workers really that much better and um, and so he went looking at the factory. And um, he had to be cautious because he was a young engineer and there was, you know, tensions between labor and management. And, um, but he started um, plotting the plan versus the actual music musician. So it looked like sheet music and he would just draw a line um, when, um, you know, the, the bars were in the machine and then when it got transferred. And then what you had was um, he, he learned to see. And so he drew the people on the chart. He drew what was happening and when and how long it took. And, and he understood the current condition. So current condition actually in a in a way kind of like we'd say today what we the value stream map in a sense although that came out of the term I forget what it is just a flow the material and information material and diagram. information yeah so it's essentially that's what he was doing it it was a material and information diagram from 1895 published uh, 1903 is the first time I think he presented it outside you know his factory. Um, but then after they would do that, then and they and they did describe it as ideal. Um, you'd have you could say, hey, this is when tasks aren't synchronized very well. There's no harmony, and what we want to do is make sure that. And actually, he said the role of a manager is like the role of a composer, right? You want to ensure each note's played at the right time, or each task is played at the right time, um, and what we're really aiming for is harmony. And so from this, we got these laws of harmony. And so we want the, the harmony of, of uh, you know, selection is talking about, you know, right sizing the equipment and operations, which so they call this rhythm is normally what they were talking about or synchrony. Um, later, some Polish uh, authors used the Polish word pact to describe the same thing. Um, and the Germans were compiling everything at the time. You know, they were taking the solutions for everything that was going on in scientific management and trying to compile it. Um, tact almost definitely came from Adamietzky's work in Poland. Yeah, and but just, it, was more, it was more around the synchronization versus what we, you know, like today, tact time, although, you know, probably got modified over the decades in, in the usage, but essentially it was about that synchronization, synchronization harmony, rhythm, of the factory so they could um, move mater information material um, effectively, efficiently, productively. Right. Yeah, it was it was about efficiency. And um, what was interesting is we probably wouldn't have translated anything else. It was just about a tool, right? Like that's interesting, the first value stream map as we would know it. But, um, but what it was, was this journey of the first, one of the first documented successful organizational transformations they had to invent the scientific method yeah. um, and learning to see and flow and then they had to you know really understand um what they termed the law of inertia of habits right and so you know people have this inertia of habits if you push too hard it's just as important as physical inertia right if you jump into a pool and belly flop it hurts right but there's different ways to enter the pool gradually or by changing you know your your um your posture so that it's easier and, and you can do it faster and so what they did was, instead of changing how people were doing their jobs at first, he just you know very carefully analyzed when the job should be done and said, hey, tomorrow, we're not going to tell anybody do your job different as far as how you're doing it, but could you please placate us and just, this is when you're going to do it. And so everybody's doing the exact same, same job, but they're just changing when they're doing it, neither earlier nor later. And so exactly on what we'd say call tact today. And, um, and they produced, they doubled or quadrupled their output on that one, and often, you know, double, quadrupled their output in other factories without changing how they did their work. Yeah, so, what forced say with some ways, so it wasn't so much about applying of tools or things like it was more about how we manage manage the operation, how we manage the people. You mentioned that 
Um, they had to be a little bit careful because if they push too much, they get resistance, but they also needed to move things forward. So it was, which we had, it was always a balance on how, how can we lead people effectively? It may not be as fast as we want, but can we lead them effectively? So ultimately we get the type of results, changes we need, we need in place to get improvements and, you know, change our current condition to they probably didn't use this term then to the target condition and that target condition, mm -hmm. once they get it in place, becomes a new current condition to take the next steps. Right. And, and actually they would use the term ideal. And so here's the ideal and, and they described ideal as not creating res resistance, right? You want to make people's jobs easier. In fact, we'll run it even a little bit slower than they did before, but we quadruple output. But then what it would force to do people to do is understand why they couldn't produce something yet. And so it forced them to understand the system and the team. And then after a couple of years, then they would look at the job methods, right? As TWI would call it. And, um, and, and in fact, he did meet Wallace Clark, the author of the Gantt chart. They went uh, through the United Nations and was trying to you know, help European factories. And so he toured Polish factories with this Karol Adamiecki and was really impressed with um, you know, the work that they had done. And they were interviewing one of these plant managers, like, what did this transformation look like? And he described that process. It's like, we first harmonized activities and, and you know, ensured that people had a voice they called the harmony of human spirit. Right. You know, we want to make sure that, you know, people are working together and collaborating and they see you know, management and, and uh, the frontline employees are in it together. Um, and then after a couple of years, um, once that trust is rebuilt, that takes time. And the only way to rebuild that trust is through, you know, um, through action. And so once they see that, yes, you're actually these aren't just words and, and you're living up to your promises, then we would start into the job methods What they what they termed. First harmonization, then tailorization. And so where, you know, I think a lot of times the inclination is to build, fix, you know, change how people are doing the work. They would do the opposite to build trust. Yeah. And I know a lot of times we have the impression, I know every plant was different, obviously, back then. We have the impression mm -hmm. going back 100 years ago, the early 20th century, you know, plant plant management was quite brutish. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure in some places it was, I kind of like it is today, in some cases, mm -hmm. but there were a lot of very... Okay. Um, uh, progressive um, innovation that went on for, again, not just the tools, but from a management standpoint, and that's something, I guess, a lesson they learned is that management aspect is certainly the lead in and important underlying to, to be able to have a place where some of the tools might be more effective along with, again, leading yeah. the people through that process. Right. Right. Um, and, and, you know, it's not to discount tools. Right. You know, the tools yeah. are powerful and important. Um, just um, what, what did Mark Rosenthal say? You just don't want to, you know, have a wrench you know, in search of a screw to pound. Right. You know, so if we understand the why behind the tool and the foundations and you know, what, what problem they're trying to solve when they invented the thing. Right. Are we having the same problem? If we are, then great. You have that understanding. If not, then thank God we didn't beat somebody over the head with it. Yeah. OK, good. Yeah, so some, you know, talk a little bit about the kind of harmony of action. Is there some more kind of more insight on that as far as like what they, how they used from, you know, I guess, I don't want to say a tool, but how they would utilize that a little bit further? I know they actually had a, um, a chart. I mean, these charts, like you mentioned, that they look, obviously look different than our value stream chart, but although in a way is trying to kind of map, map out that same type of information to capture. Right. And it, it relates, um, actually, relates to A3s. That's something else. Oh, <laughs> and uh, both Gantt and Adamieski did say print these out in either the standard A3 format or with Gantt in the 11 by 17, which was the freedom units uh, A3, right, at the time. Um, I think you did some work on, on A3s in the past, on the origins of it. I think it was a standard paper size, but um, but yeah. it was in use well before Toyota introduced, you know, reintroduced it to the world. Um, actually, that's your fault, uh, Jim. And so we reconstructed a harmonograph. But um, what they would do, and, and actually they described either a metal or a plastic, this, it was just binder clips. And so they'd say, hey, how long does this task take? Right, and then we'll cut it, kind of like a Yamazumi chart, right? And then so you'd understand how long things things took. And, you know, is it one person doing maybe two shorter ones or one person or two or one person doing the longer one? And then they would put it on these, these chats. So once they understood their actual, they'd say, okay, and they draw a line when it starts 
And if it didn't start on time, you draw a line when it was supposed to start and slide it down. And then you would slide down the bars for every other task and every other operator. And But then you had your plan versus actual. Hey, here's when we thought the task would start. Here's when it actually started. Here's how it progressed. And so what you had was instead of just a bar when it was completed, this was a like a percent complete bar. And so you just draw a horizontal line when you started or just draw a line when you started it indicated progress. And then afterwards, they would take a picture, print it in the standard A3 format. And so as you're striving to meet your ideal, you start to understand the issues that you're having where to focus your improvement efforts until you reach ideal. Yeah, and, and with that, they, didn't they use that because a lot of times, you know, um, you know, customer demand would fluctuate. So didn't they use these tools too to help them with, with that fluctuation and changes? Again, back to, they wanted a operational efficiency um, as well, but also again, the demand can change, you know, maybe week to week or during different times of the year. And they were able to utilize these tools to help them manage that more effectively right and um what's interesting about that too is you know they, they tended to think a little bit broader too so if a lot of different companies are starting to manufacture a new product you know understanding that if you flood the market you reduce the price and so price wasn't just how, how much does it um, cost us to produce and then add x percent profit right but it was the profit was hey what's the customer actually willing to pay for this and then planning for your demand accordingly. And so we're talking about right-sizing the equipment. Like if, you know, we don't want to flood the market because then it's worth less and then nobody has it because we all went out of business. Um, but so what, how much do people actually need? Let's buy the right sort of equipment that we, you know, in, in order to produce that. And then tact was more about running it efficiency, you know, efficiently. And so understanding that like a biological organism, you and I, um, if we're, there's a cost, even if we're sleeping, we're burning some energy. If we're running a marathon or sprints, right? Um, you can't do, can't do sprints forever, it, it'll wear you out. But there's some optimal working efficiency for the plant. And uh, you're running too much overtime, right? You're burning people out. There's the human spirit factor, um, but there's some sort of optimal tact, the, the rhythm that you can run at um, most efficiently. And uh, that's kind of what they, they looked at for, for uh, for setting the pace of the factory. Next, maybe to bring this somewhat back forward, I, that's one of the things in, in Profit Beyond Measure, Tom Johnson's book, he he talks a lot about, about not looking at the organization as you know a mechanical um, system, but more as a living organization. As an which, organism. Again, they, were, they were doing that 100 years ago in some of these more progressive factories, looking at it from more organically with the dynamics and again, the big part of the people factor that they were um, right. trying to work and deal with. Yeah, it almost seems a little strange as somebody like in like Henry Le Chatelier, we might know him from a chemistry textbook for, you know, a paragraph, but what a big deal he was back in the day. And so really establishing the foundations of chemistry or helping to. And then, but why would he get into scientific management? It was this an organization, organ, right? Um, it's from from human organs and, and systems. Um you know, the, the biologists and the chemists were, were really, you know, understood this as, as, as kind of the same thing. And so you have this organism, this organization that's the pieces have to work together. And when they broke down the foundational principles that people were waiting for this, um, you, know, you had Adam Smith and division of labor when, it, you know, something's too complicated in biology, this would be your cell. Right. You have your skin cells and bone cells and, and blood cells. And so you differentiate it and then you'd have to concentrate and integrate them. Right. So this is Le Chatelier's law. So when we break down a process in a factory um, into different tasks, you know, there's different ways to do it. And sometimes it's, it might not be logical. So you have to put some thought into doing this properly. And then how do we put it back together in the right measure and then as an organ system? So you have your organs and organ systems in a factory and actually translating from uh, the European authors would use what we might say a work cell, they call an organ, which doesn't sound good in English, but these were the organ and organelles of the factory and the work cell. Actually, somebody asked, uh, was the genius of Toyota not the tools, but their assembly into a harmonious, continuously oh. improving uh, systematic approach to crushing, to crushing the time from order to payment by respecting people and using innovation over capital? I think in some ways you're kind of articulating. Yeah, probably. And greetings from Ireland. Um, yeah. yeah, I think so. And um, 
And, and they didn't do it overnight interesting... either. They had some struggles with that. It wasn't like the light bulb went off and they just did it. They went through some struggles right. in order to figure that out. That might be even another podcast on their transformation. So we tend to focus on the outcome of Toyota. And I think this is getting at, hey, what did the transformation look like? And it started when they were about to have a strike, yeah. right, in, in their own history. Yeah. And um, so they, they started focusing on the problems that people were having on the line. Um, the first kind of 20%, they said they would teach, um, they would show the people how to make improvements. And then the other 80% was the people making their own improvements. And, uh, but it was... Um, um, people were very upset when they decreased the tack time, right? And so they, they realized they were about to have a revolt. Well, part of this, and something you know, I've talked about, again, looking at, I guess, this maybe some of the connection between what they were working on in the past, far past, maybe not so far past, Toyota, and even to the present is, uh, and they did work on this back then, it was a lot of their attention was on how, how do they change the habits? So maybe, yeah. maybe touch on it. Same that's the same issue we have today. They had that same issue 100 years ago, whether they're in Japan, U.S., or Europe. Yeah, and I really like that, that even back then they called it the law of inertia of habits. We touched on it a little bit. And um, and so they had the principle, the countermeasure that they used was this principle of gradualism, right? And so ignore this at your own peril, right? If you try to force people to change faster, they're comfortable with changing, it's going to hurt. And if there's people here listening who have been part of a failed organizational transformation or maybe even, you know, led one in the past, um, it's painful. And, um, and it reduces the kind of the risk tolerance that people have for doing it again. Um, and so what they did was changing not how people did their work, but when they did their work gradually over time until people became comfortable. Um, and then I think and we've learned a bit about that, too, as far as we're talking about not individuals, but groups. Um, you know, the law of diffusion and the tipping point, but how do people adopt new ways of thinking? And so instead of teaching everybody all at once and forcing everybody to give up the rotary phone or the iPod or adopt an electric car, there's people who want the VCR first. They're like, eh, it costs a lot of money. It probably won't work well, but I'm willing to take the risk. No big deal. And then there's other people who aren't opposed to it, but they want to see it work. Yeah. And then, and then how much data you need, you know, it depends kind of where you fall on the curve or how you know, important it is to you. And you might be an innovator in um, electric vehicles, but you might be a laggard in organizational change. Like I've seen flavor of the month uh, 20 times. I don't want any part of this. And uh, that's fine. You know, you need skeptical people who need more data in your organization, um, but don't treat them as the enemy. Right. And so I think there's a couple different ways. You know, if you want need to change, you know, everybody to start adopting something all at once, just to understand kind of what their pain threshold is. And you can't push past that. And, and it's going to be slow. Um, it can go a lot faster, I think, if you choose the willing first. Like, hey, we're going to try this new lean thing. We're going to try this new agile or scientific operational excellence. Um, we don't know how it's going to work here yet. You know, who's who's in? It's going to be a lot more work. When and um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I say go ahead. I, I, I say um, some some of this looking at you know look at the past and again kind of through I guess the Toyota and into the present. So one thing I know at Toyota, like I said, they they struggled with this. They were they were trying to um, somewhat emulate the early Ford Motor Company and were struggling with it because the Ford Motor Company was high volume, you know, kind of lower mix relative to Toyota. Toyota was lower volume, high mix, but mm -hmm. felt that kind of four early, early Ford model would apply. But the thing is, is Ono, back to Teichi Ono, he was trying to work through that, but he was basically unsuccessful, probably eight years in the machine shop. And eventually what he, what kind of came into play that helped him through to be able to emulate that in their certain context, you know, the lower volume, higher mix. Um, and also back to, as a, the person mentioned that question, they, they, had, they had a cash flow problem on top of it, just to compound the problem. Um, was uh, when the TWI programs came in, those skill sets on which which ties into how do we how do we help help change people their habits, right to today. So there has to be something to practice. Um, I know uh, it was interesting, right? You know, before we get into you know how to practice and how to change the habits as far as uh, deliberately and and you know what what do we actually practice? With, you know what what cards or scripts are we going to use? Um, 
there's something that I learned from you last week um, when we're talking about kind of their evolution. And so, you know, what, what do you need to understand as a leader in an organization, right? You need to understand the technical flows and material and information flows, um, you know, how to synchronize all this together. The most important element, harmony of human spirit. Yeah. Um, and then what they realized back then, and Damieski wrote, uh, I think, the first value stream map. And so not the material and information flow diagram from 1895, but 1926 on cost flows. And yeah. so we realized that managers had a really bad understanding of economics and cost. And so it wasn't all about cost and profit. In fact, even back then, it's the goal of the organization was not about profit. It was about helping humanity and people. But um, but but you have to understand the cost flows too. It's important. And they would print this out on the monthly A3. And it was just kind of like a Sankey diagram. Maybe we can pull up a, a diagram later, but they would just have these kind of widths of um, of the, the rivers and the rivulets, if you will, representing the cost flows from how much did it cost to buy our supplies? Where do we spend it on lighting, on labor, on overtime? And um, did we put more into inventory than we sold? And it would enable a conversation between finance and operations. And it you know, wasn't telling them the answer, but any good visual management tool just helps you see. And you can yeah. say, hey, we spent a lot more putting money into inventory this than we sold, what's going on? It's like, oh, sales are fine. We're ramping up for Christmas, whatever it is. And, uh, or, oh, I didn't know that. That's a problem. Let's dig into that. You need to go bit. investigate further. Uh, and then you mentioned that it was TWI was kind of the same evolution, right? Yeah. There was job instruction and, you know, how to coach people and methods and, and job relations. And then I didn't know about the economics piece. Yeah. They, they, you know, so yeah, yeah. First thing during, uh, during the war effort first, the first problem. So they were trying to countermeasure a problem was how do we, mm -hmm. how do we get these people trained when production, you know, for the war productions ramping up and we had this mass, you know, um, um, coming into industry of green people, you know, the Rosie, the river people. They have no experience. Yeah. They have no background. Um, so how do we get them ramped up quickly but safely, and so we can get our our production out? Um, so it's and that's the thing I think we've learned with the, some of the TWI. And then you know came in um, you know after that you know job methods. How do we make improvements? Which was how do we do industrial engineering on the shop floor without necessarily having to have an army of, of engineers and job relations. How do we do, I think two things, resolve people problems because you know it's always involving people. So there's people problems that come in, but also too, one of the things with, uh, uh, and I know people are doing this today with JR, it's just the, the, the go and find the, um, do the analysis, what's going on, what's the current condition. So part of the JR is just understand what's going on. How can you make a decision on what to do when you don't really understand what's going on? So there's a lot of, and, even though there's skills, there's a lot of management methodology embedded in them. And still using the scientific method, but yeah. the the problem that we're looking at is building relationships between people. Yeah. Um, with that, it's interesting. There's a, you want a great semantic debate between tool heads, right? Uh, ask them if it's PDCA or PDSA. Yeah. And uh, so Henry Le Chatelier came up, it was PDCA, they, they had different uh, um, acronyms, but um, but it, I think it looked really familiar. So scientific method was set your goal, kind of step zero, what's your direction and challenge in Toyota Kata terms, right? And then, but most of the time was spent on analysis. So you'd start with the A. And so you'd be analysis, and then you'd plan, right? You know, and, and which might include training. So, hey, we have this analysis and we kind of understand what our ideal state needs to look like. And now we need a plan for implementation, need to do or execute. And then the C was control, which initially, like I, I had no interest in even reading the article about control as an essential element of, of scientific management, but it was control of experiments. And so we want to we understand where we change this variable and we, we need to control the process. And if we didn't, then we need to address what's going on. And a lot of times it was training. It was never about blaming the employee. And even if you go back and read the Gantt chart, they mathematically show that 90% of the problems came from management and stated that. Right. And so we heard that from Deming, but they're like, hey, where's your data? But they had data from 1921, whenever the Gantt chart you know, came out. But, um, and that's yeah, what they tend to learn. Knew that was he, an issue. It wasn't, it wasn't a people problem. It was a management problem, although it was a management problem. We are 100 years later, and we still don't really take that as to heart and execute it as well as we should. 
Right. And maybe that's part of the communication with employees too. If we're talking about habits and the employee piece, you know, nobody, everybody gets a little bit nervous to show up with a clipboard and a, and a stopwatch, but including them on it. And then when they see it, like, oh, you didn't meet what we thought you would meet today. We have a management problem, right? We have a training problem, right? You're, we hired you because you're smart enough. Um, but the only way to get through that, I, I would say engage the people that are more willing to engage first. Um, and then other people will start to come along. But uh, but once you behave accordingly, you're not blaming people and, and oh, they're, they are really here to help us for identifying the problems and, and tackling them. And if it's training, then, then that's okay, but we're not blaming the people for not being able to do the job. Yeah, so actually kind of coming up on our target time, is there any kind of last kind of last things you wanna kind of let people know and we'll get wrapped up here? Um, I think, Actually, yeah, like um, a little bit of a tangent um, with, uh, you know, how to how to drill and, and um, you know, how do we practice this stuff? And so I think there's some great things with JR. Um, uh, actually, if we can, I'll, I'll plug your, um, your skills lab seems awesome to me. I want to hear a little bit more about that as far as how to practice. But and then, but in broader strokes, um, if you look for great coaches, it's actually harder to find them in business than it is in athletics. Yeah. And so, even though there's probably too many athlete, athletic uh, comparisons or analogies in business, um, I'll I'll use one. And there was um, a really winning jujitsu coach, uh, John Donaher. He's his first principles thinking for um, for teaching there. And so, you know, why do people quit? Why don't people have you know, have an opportunity to become better and stick with it long enough? And so if you're new, a lot of times you wind up in the worst position ever. And so instead of just drilling on a finishing move in jujitsu or something you know awesome in with process improvement, we just want to get into the improvements. If you're in on the bottom being suffocated in jujitsu or at work, right? If you're just being suffocated, you're in a high blame environment. Um, don't worry about improvement yet. What, what you want is this kind of psychological safety. And so what, what he would do is I'm going to train people how to get out of the bad position because you're a white belt. You're always going to be in this horrible position and it sucks. And we're going to teach you finishing moves that you'll never get to use. And what you would see even at black belt levels, you know, black belt levels is if they got the great position, they'd be scared to do anything because they weren't confident that they'd be able to get back out of a bad position. And so by ensuring psychological safety and saying, hey, we have a high blame environment, then you're probably not going to change that even as a CEO, everyone, everywhere, all at once, right? So which group are we going to practice? How do we want to interact with each other? Um, I, I know it was with uh, a healthcare organization. We Cleveland Clinic is kind of the benchmark in, in healthcare, right? And they, they showed at a conference, believe it or not, Getting doctors to wash their hands is a leading cause of infection and um, and really low compliance. And um, and nobody wants to be the dirty doctor. And, and they and they can all tell you yes to transmit germs, but you're busy and you won't do it. And so they they came up with a countermeasure. Hey, if we see somebody not wash their hands walking into a patient room, we'll snap. I'm like great, we'll implement that. You know, we'll just copy. And our organization was not having it. Like, really? You're just gonna snap in somebody's face? I'm like, oh my God. And uh, so this simple countermeasure of getting doctors to wash their hands was a culture change. So how do we wanna talk to each other? How do I wanna be called out? How do I wanna be called out in front of the patient? Right, and uh, they came up with something there that was pretty awesome, I think. Like, hey, if we see that, I'll just walk over with this bottle of Purell, I'll dump it right in the doctor's hands. And then we look like a team. Like, oh, thank you. And, um, but uh, it was kind of this um, importance of benchmark, but don't copy. And then if you're in this horrible environment where people are used to blaming each other, that's what you got to start with. Now, as far as tools and techniques, um, you know, Toyota Kata, TWI, you know, we have these scripts that kind of uh, we can use as a foundation that I think are really good. Um, and then the, the skills lab, I think, is interesting. Can you walk me through that a little bit? Because I haven't been to it. And I've talked to some people who had, and, and they were doing awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just real quick, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. I think we're in our target time. But yeah, basically, what we teach it is we teach the skills of job instruction, job methods, job uh, relations, um, the improvement kata, coaching kata, and just coaching good coaching habits. So people not only teach them, but they go out and practice them, practice them in a in a near real life situation on a operational line 
to do it. So not just to learn each one of those so they know each one and practice them, but then we have them go through cycles where they're practice, which ideally is where you want to get to, practicing them in tandem with each other. When do you use them? Well, it depends on the circumstances and what your needs are at that moment. So we give them opportunities to practice those things, um, you know, overlaying with each other, practice them simultaneously. So that's that's part of it. And I, and I think in, in doing that to wrap it up, I think someone asked kind of what's the maybe the key points of this. I think one is looking uh, at kind of in, in a title of this is it's it's not really about the tools. It's really about more of the management system. And that does involve mm. looking at a broader picture, certainly looking at people and from a like a, a living organization standpoint that these things got to interact um, synchronously with, with each other. And the tools are just there real, as a really secondary type of thing to help you achieve that bigger picture of your organization functioning in harmony. Now that's still a pretty abstract saying, but each organization is gonna have a little bit different take on that because their, their culture's different, their product's different, their markets are a little bit different, but it's really about getting a good management system in place and the tools are just ways to help you achieve that, not the lead-ins to that. And, and if you understand, um, you know, basically your organization, the difference between where the tool was invented, like, hey, we can adapt yeah. this one, or maybe we can copy it directly. But all we're trying to do is understand what are we promising to do? What do we want to do versus what are we actually doing? And there's some sort of gap. And then how do we identify the obstacles in the way? Um, and that's that's all, all the good tools do is, and they help to facilitate conversations between people. Hey, um, in fact, there was a um, you don't have to do the uh, initial value stream map. There's an easy Sankey diagram, and I, I put a link into it. Um, it's, it's, you can make one for free. It's just, what are some of these, you know, how do we visualize economics? But it's not a profit and loss statement. How do we understand what's going on in a factory? You don't have to, I'm not saying go out and create harmonographs and, and Gantt charts, right? That's the, that, that's not the point here. It's, Hey, you know, we we want harmony and flow throughout our organization between people. And it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's a factory or an office. Yeah. But we want great material and information flows between people. We want to make sure people love coming into work. They're looking forward to having interaction with me tomorrow. And it might be a JR. It might be job relations tomorrow because yesterday they were really motivated to solve this problem and they're really good at it. Um, but today something happened and they're depressed. And so now we have to flip over to to that. And uh, I think if you can find anything to practice that in a safe environment, and so the first time you're practicing, you don't you don't want it to be a conflict, right? And so all of a sudden you're that's how I learned as a supervisor, right? You know, hey, you're a supervisor now, so there's an employee conflict. Go deal with it. And, but if you can have the safe space where you can, you can, uh, um, you know, go through these in a safe, a safe environment and, and kind of prototype it, right? Um, I, I think that's that's pretty key. Okay. So in in with, with the people that you trust at work, um, you can practice it. Hey, you know, make a prediction scientifically. How do you think this conversation is going to go? Oh, okay, if they say this, what are you going to say? Oh, how do you think they're going to react? Not well. Okay, well, why are you going to say that? It's like, oh, you're right. I'll say something. I'll say something else. And then, then you can go back after and debrief. Hey, it didn't go so well. This is what actually happened. Okay. All right. Well, with that, we'll uh, thank you, Craig. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your insight on all this. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And Skyline, if you want to come in and give a quick... Uh... Just a quick reminder, you will receive a link from us within 24 to 48 hours. The TWI and Kata Summit will also be in April of this year. So if you have not checked out that, that is up. Um, the registration is up. We are still currently working on the agendas. But I believe that is all for today. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Jim. We will see you all again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.